arguing, fighting, cussing, feuding, carrying on. Oh, yeah, and people come to church, and that goes on in their homes. Amen? I'm preaching. And, you know, and, and then if the neighbors hear it, and you go next door and invite them to church, that's an awesome testimony. Amen? That's an awesome testimony. At work, there are a lot of people, Jesus doesn't go to work with them. Jesus doesn't go to family gatherings with them. Jesus doesn't, uh, isn't invited into all kinds of areas of their life. And this is what I want you to know. Where Jesus is not invited in, the blessing of God follows Jesus. If he's not in, welcomed, the blessing and the anointing to touch and heal those areas of your life will not be there either. Amen? They will not be there either. So you need to understand that. You need to know that. Now, hopefully it won't be like these two friends that met for coffee. Another joke. And the one brother said to the, uh, the one friend said to the other, and I got fired the other day. And he said, you got fired? What for? He said, following the preacher's advice. He said, you got fired following your preacher's advice? He said, yep, I followed it to the letter. Well, what did he say? He said, we ought to act the exact same way at work that we do at church. And he said, so I showed up late. I went only when I wanted to. I frequently slept. And I looked most of the time very disinterested. And they fired me. <laughs> How many of you know that if you acted towards work the same way you act towards church, you'd get fired too? Amen? You'd get fired too. So let's look at the scripture for today. Now, when Jesus had come into Peter's house, Jesus has just begun his ministry. He's, he's moving around with the disciples, and he has come into Peter's house. So when he comes into Peter's house, the presence of God is in Peter's house. If Jesus hadn't entered Peter's house, this situation would have remained the same. And when Jesus is not invited into the various areas of your life, the situations and problems remain the same. If Jesus isn't invited into your work life, your work life will never have the anointing of God. If Jesus isn't invited into your school, your school work life will never have the anointing of God. If Jesus isn't invited into your family, you'll never have the uh, anointing and favor of God over your family. See, that confuses a lot of people. I go to church faithfully. And my life is a mess. Well, that's because you left Jesus at the door of the church. You know, I, I almost didn't want to use this illustration, but I know it's a very popular genre right now. You know, one of the interesting things about the vampire genre, if you've ever watched any of those, is the vampire comes to the door, what happens? He has to be invited in. And they, they can't come in without being invited in. Did you know the Holy Spirit operates that exact same way? God does not enter any area of your life that you do not invite him into. Jesus does not enter any area of your life that you don't open to him. Amen? But when you open that area to the Lord, then and only then will he come in. Then and only then can he begin to act. So you need to know that. It's time to stop the... Uh, fussing and fighting at home and invite Jesus in. It's time to stop the swearing and cussing at home and invite Jesus in. It's time to uh, do the things that you wouldn't uh, want anyone else to know that you do those things at home. It's time to lay those things aside and invite Jesus in. Amen? First of all, Jesus sees all. Jesus sees everything. Nothing's hidden from God. He saw that his mother's wife, Peter's mother's wife, laying sick with a fever. Now, Jesus knew that anyway. He knew that outside the house. But in order to impact the situation, he had to be invited in. This is one of the things you have to realize. Jesus isn't blind past the church doors. He, he doesn't see, you know, don't think he doesn't see what goes on at home. Don't think he doesn't see if you're sitting there at the computer pulling up pornography. 
Don't think he doesn't see if you're sitting there in your bedroom reading uh, overtly sexual romantic novels as a woman. Don't think he doesn't see uh, the way that you act with family. Don't think he doesn't see that you won't talk to this relative or you won't speak to that relative or you haven't forgiven this relative. He sees all that. He knows all that. Nothing is hidden from him. And if nothing is hidden from him, guess what? You might as well go ahead and invite him in because he knows it anyway. But the only time he can have an impact on it is when you invite him in. Jesus was, will only take action when he's invited into the situation or circumstance. And he touched her hand. And it says that the fever left her. And he touched her hand. This is going to be a short sermon. That'll be a miracle. You can go back out and tell the community, we witnessed a miracle today. The pastor preached a short sermon. But you need to know something. You've got to invite him into your home, and he will begin touching the situations that need it. You have to begin to invite him into work, and he'll begin touching the situations that need it. You need to begin to invite him into the family, and he'll begin touching the situations that need it. You need to begin to invite him into every aspect of your life. You know, invite him into your finances, and he'll begin touching and blessing your finances. You know, a lot of people, their finances are never blessed because they've never invited Jesus into their finances. You know, you have to invite him in. And, and how, part of how you know his will is get in his word. You know, how do I know uh, what to do with my finances? Read his word. Study his word in that area. How do I know what to do about my family? Read his word. Study his word in that area. You know, for instance, there was a woman that had a lot of trouble at work. And a lot of Christians have problems at work. I've, I've known Christians that have worked, quit top dollar wages. I knew a woman, I think she made $18 an hour about 10 years ago, working as a surgical nurse assistant. $18 an hour. How many of you would like to make $18 an hour? And that's not counting overtime and other stuff that she did. She made about $18 an hour, something that she might have made more than that. I, that's the figure that sticks in my head. But she didn't get along with anybody at work. She, every time I saw her, oh, they mistreat me at work. Oh, they just judge me at work. Oh, they just pick on me at work. And I know part of what the problem was, she had such an attitude of self-righteousness that when she was around all these lost people and she couldn't help but sh show how self-righteous she felt, they all felt condemned and judged and guess what? You don't want to be around somebody that makes you feel condemned and judged. Amen? And if you can make their life a little more miserable so that you can chase them out, guess what you're going to do? You're going to make their life, especially if you're a heathen or an unbeliever, you're going to make their life a little miserable, and you're going to try to chase them out. I remember reading about one woman that had a problem like that in an office complex. There was a woman that absolutely did not like her the moment she found out she was a Christian. She found out later that she'd had real problems with the church when she was a child and the way that she felt her family had been treated. So when she grew up, she didn't have any use for Christians, especially in the workplace. And she really made this woman's daily work in this office a problem. And then she'd heard a sermon about when your enemies uh, do good for those who hate you, bless those who persecute you. Amen? Amen. And all the rest that the scripture has to say about those situations. And so the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, you need to do that at work with this gal. And so she went to work and she walked over to her and she said, I'm done early. Is there anything I can help you with? And she looked at her kind of shocked, like, why are you wanting to do that? And she said, well, I've got my work done and I'm still here. Is there something you'd like some help with? So she started helping her every chance she got. And she started uh, doing other things for her. Like she knew that she often liked to go to this certain fast food place for lunch. She knew what she ordered. And she knew some days she had to work completely through lunch. So she would purposely go to the fast food place, 
buy that woman's lunch and bring it back to her. Just a few months of that acts of kindness, just a few months of showing, of doing what the Bible says to do, just a few months of inviting Jesus into her workplace, and the woman who was her number one enemy at her workplace began to ask her about the Lord and began to ask her about church and eventually ended up going to church and becoming a believer again. Come on, give the Lord some praise. Amen. Yes, somebody in your family's done done you wrong. Get over it. Forgive them like Jesus has forgiven you. Amen. And start to bless them every opportunity you get. Start to encourage them every opportunity you get. And you will see God begin to work in their life. Well, they don't deserve it. You're right, they don't. Neither did you gave you you didn't deserve it either amen so it's just a matter of doing it when Jesus is invited in and he begins touching the affected areas of your life the infected areas of your life you begin to see results Jesus came in the scripture says he touched her hand and it says and the fever left her and the fever left her a lot of us run around, we pray about our families, nothing changes. We pray about our marriage, nothing changes. We pray about our finances, nothing changes. We pray about all this different stuff and nothing changes. You know why it's not changing? You haven't invited Jesus in. Well, I've prayed about it. And I've, you know, asked him to do something about it. Yeah, well, you still haven't invited him in. That's like talking to somebody and telling them, Man, I want you to come over and clean my house up. You know, uh, I had a friend whose, whose wife was, uh, she'd been raised in abject poverty. This woman's family lived in an old school bus. That's where she grew up. That was home. Which is probably a palace compared to some of the places my wife lived in, right? Huh? But one thing about Sharon's house and, and her mother, you could aid off the floor uh, in that little house because they kept it spotless. But not everybody's like that. And this woman was just not a good housekeeper. I mean, not at all. He invited me into his house one time because he didn't think I would believe it. There was a path through clothes and other stuff. My wife will tell you our house gets like that sometimes because of me. <laughs> there was a path to the, uh, to the bedroom, a path to the sink. The sink looked like a science experiment gone crazy. I mean, there was, it was like a green mountain in the sink. I mean, it was horrible. She, this woman did not keep house. This woman knew nothing about keeping house. And every bedroom had piles of dirty clothes. And he had been fired. He had lost two churches because of that. Because people had come into the parsonage or, or had, you know, noticed those problems. And finally, I told him, I said, brother, your wife is just not a housekeeper. She ain't never going to be a housekeeper. I said, but she's very talented. She does all kinds of office stuff. I said, get that woman a job, and if it takes every penny of the money she makes to pay somebody to come and clean your house after you guys get it reasonably cleaned up, I said, it'll be well worth it. And shortly thereafter was the last time she ever didn't have a job. And they, they paid people to come in and straighten up their house you know your house can be a wreck you can pay you can talk to somebody about coming in and clean up your house uh, but until you invite them in until you give them a key until you let them in or they can't touch or clean anything you can pray and invite Jesus verbally all you want but until you actually let him in until you actually open yourself up to his word and his spirit until you actually decide I'm going to act the way the Word of God says I should act in these situations. I'm going to invite the Lord in. It's only when you invite him in that he can begin to touch the areas of your life that need touching. Amen? Jesus touches us for a reason. A lot of us as Christians think that God does things for us just because he loves us and just because he forgives us and all that other stuff. You know, we like the family picture of the kingdom of God, and that is very much a picture of the kingdom of God, but it's also an army. 
That private doesn't get his paycheck, doesn't get his clothes, and doesn't get his food so he can sit around the barracks and play Nintendo. Amen. He's expected to report for duty. He's expected to serve. Amen. He's expected to work. You know, when's the last time your boss said, sent you your check, but told you you can stay home, do whatever you want to do? You know, kick back, just do whatever. It'll never happen. You get paid in order to come and serve. You get paid in order to come and work. Jesus doesn't bless us solely to bless us. There's a reason behind his blessing. He's entered the house from a long journey. He's hungry. The disciples are hungry. Men didn't cook back then. Some men still don't. I, I love to. I had a lady one time had to leave. She was a woman board member. She had to leave the board meeting early. I said, why do you have to go? She says, i got to go home and make my so husband a sandwich. I said, doesn't he know how to make a sandwich? She said, he's never done it, and he probably never will. I said, I'd have taught him real fast, right? One thing Sharon never had to worry about was me going hungry. <laughs> never once had to worry about me going hungry, have you, honey? If she ain't home to feed me, that is no problem. So anyway, but the point is this. You have to learn Jesus came in, he was hungry. The disciples were hungry. Men in that culture didn't prepare anything, and they need something. And there's the woman of the house is laying there with a fever. She can't serve very well with a fever. So he touches her for a reason, and she gets up after the fever left her, and it says, and she arose and did what? Served them. He touches us so that we can serve him and others. Now ask yourself a question. Can you serve God better well or sick? Well, you know, if for no other reason start asking the Lord to stop your progression of your sickness and even uh, hold it there or cause it to retreat, because, Lord, I'm not able to serve you as well, and I want to serve. Amen? I want to serve. I'm convinced a lot of people, a lot of older people, live many years past what they would live because they serve. I remember years ago reading a story by Kenneth Hagin Sr. Uh, there was a woman that he had known for years. She was in her late 80s, and she had been a church worker but she was very sick, and she was already the oldest person that had ever lived to be that age in her family, and they invited Kenneth Hagin Sr. over to pray. And when he got there, she said, Brother, I'm ready to go home, but there's still things I'd like to do for the Lord. Pushing her, her uh, late 80s. And Brother Hagin said, Well, sister, you know, you've earned your rest. And she said, I know, but there's just too much still to do for the Lord. You pray for me that I'll be able to get up from here and serve the Lord again. He prayed for that woman. God touched her that night. She got up from that sick bed and outworked her kids and outworked people. She drove uh, older people, <laughs> older than her, there weren't many. She drove people to the hospital. She delivered meals. She did all kinds of things. That woman lived to be 99 years old, still serving her church, still serving her community, never slowing down a lick, and just went home to be with the Lord in her sleep one night with her family rejoicing because she served the Lord another decade. Come on, give the Lord some praise. She served the Lord another decade. Alive for a purpose. Christians don't retire. Believers don't retire. Preachers don't retire. If I'm in a nursing home and can still preach, I'll preach to the people in the nursing home. Amen. If I've got Alzheimer's, I'll just keep repeating the same sermon. <laughs> but you know, you have to know that he's, he heals us for a reason. Can you serve God better when there are areas of your life that are infected with sin or when you're healthy? You can serve God better when you're healthy. So arise, take up your bed, and walk. Arise and serve God and others. Amen? Invite 
Jesus in. Even our health. You know, even what we eat. The Word has a lot to say about that. Amen? You know, and uh, nobody likes food any better than me. If they do, I ain't met them yet. And though I kind of backslid over the fourth, Sharon came home after working on the fifth, and all the leftovers from the fourth had been eaten. Virtually every last one of them. She said, you didn't even leave me a hamburger or a hot dog? I said, no, baby, they're gone. <laughs> every bag of open chips was ate. <laughs> I mean, it was just gone. An entire bag, all that fruit you brought, that whole bag, about a gallon bag, a gallon bag of melons and watermelon and melon, gone. Gone. That, that was a snack, buddy, let me tell you. <laughs> I, I love to eat, but I have to pray and ask the Lord to help me and discipline me. Or, you know, I'd weigh four or 500 pounds easy because I love to eat. Amen? But I know that overeating is, can be a sin, and it can have adverse effects on your life. You can overeat every once in a while and repent. Thank God I believe in a God of grace and mercy. Come on, some of the rest of you know what I'm talking about. You've sinned too. <laughs> you, but, you know, you can't make it a habit. Amen? You can't make it a habit. Can I get an amen? You can't make it a habit. So let's do this quick review. It got a little longer than I thought it would. Invite Jesus in into every area of your life. Just look at your life and say, where is the anointing and blessing of God not? If it's not there in different areas of your life, it's probably because you haven't really seriously invited him in. You haven't really seriously invited him in. Jesus sees all. You might as well just acknowledge that. There's nothing hidden from God. That's why we, we might as well come clean with God all the time is because there's nothing you do, nothing you think that is hidden from him. The amazing thing is he loves you anyway and forgives you anyway. Amen? Jesus only takes action when you invite him in, when invited in. So invite him in. When we come to the altar today, as we prepare to receive communion, I want you to take a moment and think of the areas of your life that you need to invite the Lord in. Invite him into those various areas of your life. Jesus is the one who gets results. Amen? You know, part of the good news is this, folks. We have the answer to every problem in a person's life. Do you realize that? You have the answer to every problem in a person's life. It is a one-word answer. Jesus. That is the answer to every problem in a person's life. It doesn't matter what it is. Jesus is the answer. Amen? Jesus is the answer. And, and if you haven't accepted that yet yourself, you need to accept that, that the answer to every problem in my life is Jesus. And then finally, Jesus heals us so that we may serve. Jesus heals us so that we may serve. Ask the Lord. Where can I serve? What are you preparing for me? What's your plans for my future? And as long as we have breath, we should serve. As long as we have strength, we should serve. As long as we are able, we should serve. Amen? Let's give the Lord some praise. Hallelujah. We're going to kind of combine the altar, offering, and communion. So you can give towards the Italy trip any time, just in the other, put Italy and whatever amount God br uh, brings to your heart. There are people being obedient to the Lord supernaturally because I knew when the Lord started directing me to take this Italy trip that he wanted me to go. I knew back in January, and I said, God, it's just not possible. I don't have that kind of money. I can't possibly do that. And he kept quickening me with it every time I met him. And then I walked in a district council, 
And right there, very, one of the very first booths I walked up to was the Italy booth for Verona, and the missionary's wife was standing right there. And we talked probably 45 minutes. I missed most of what was going on in the meeting because she told me how, how much the people over there need to be loved, those international workers. She said, Pastor King, just preach a simple gospel. Just speak into their lives. They're, such, they're so hurting and rejected people that they just need. They're persecuted people in that nation. Economically persecuted, not treated well. Like immigrants all over the world, it's not just the Italians. People are, any immigrants are treated that way. And, uh, and God put it on my heart. And then I, I thought, well, I'll have to try to go in January because there's no way I can raise funds by October. But she said October's a far better month to go. And, uh, but I just said, well, that's not possible. And I felt, hear, kept hearing the Lord say, you know, no, you need to go in October. And I even told my family I'd try to go in January because I thought I could raise quite a bit of that money by then. And uh, the, when I called them, or they called me and said, January's taken, now we just got October and November available. Again, I knew when I needed to go. And then my friend that's going with me, he can go in October, and that will help cut expenses. But I believe this is a God thing. I think not only will I enjoy myself there and see sites that I, otherwise I'd probably never get to see, but also... I believe God's sending me there to speak a word to that church. I believe that God's sending me there to, to bless those people and to leave them with some things that are going to help them and help that church to grow and reach more people. Amen? So uh, pray about it. God's, God's moved on people supernaturally, told me that one offering was going to be given to me, told me the amount, and, and it's supernatural, and God did it. And others that he has moved upon because that's what it's going to take. It's going to take a supernatural blessing from God to be able to do, to do it. And what I go with is what I go with. You know, it's about 1500 to fly over there. It's 600 for the apartment. It's gas for the car, food while I'm there. And then any travel or staying any place is all extra. So uh, that's where I'm at. So let's stand together. We wanted you to come. Receive the elements of communion. Make this your altar call to. If you've not yet invited Jesus into the most basic part of your life, which is salvation, you need to know today something. He is ready to be your Savior. He has a plan for your life, and it's a great plan. He has a purpose for your life, and it's a great purpose. Amen? But you need to receive Him as Savior first so that you can do that. Don, I'm going to have them just put it in that jar there. And then I, you can begin coming. And then I want you to think of every area of your life. We have communion on both sides. It's open for all believers. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you do not have to be a member of this church to come and receive communion. Then make your way back to your seat. and We'll partake of it together. But when you go back to your seats, I want you thinking about Lord, where have I shut you out? Where have I not let you in to my life? Folks, there can be all kinds of areas. It can be your eating. It can be your health. It can be work. It can be family. Family can be a very trying thing. But you know, sometimes God's put you in the middle of a difficult family because he wants you to minister to them. He's got you there for a purpose and a reason. Invite him in. You you work where you work for a purpose and a reason. You may be the only born-again believer in the place, or you may be the only one bold enough to truly live your faith. You're there for a reason. Invite Jesus into your workplace and say, Lord, I don't just work here for a paycheck. I work here because you've placed me here as a missionary. I have a divine purpose in this place. I have a divine purpose in this place. Help me to find it. Help me to fulfill it.
Father, one of the things that we're accused of most by young people today is hypocrisy. That's because, Lord, they see us with Jesus in church. They see us talk about him, walk with him, praise him, honor him. And then they're in the car with their parents or aunts or uncles or relatives, and they see us drive home and leave Jesus behind. God, many were raised in homes where Jesus wasn't present. Many were raised by families where Jesus was always the one left behind at church. God, they grow up and they go to work with Christians, and they see that at work, They've left Jesus at church. They grow up, Lord God, and they go to school with Christians. They see at school Christians have left Jesus at church. Maybe they marry a believer because we can't help who we fall in love with. And so often Christian husbands or Christian wives see things or non-Christian husbands and non-Christian wives see things in their Christian spouse that they know is not right in their marriage and their relationship with their family. It is often because we have left Jesus at church. It is time to invite you in to every area of our life because you already know all and you already see all, but you can only touch when you've been asked in. So we do that today as we partake of this communion. The Apostle Paul said, For I received from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner after supper, he took a cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul wrote, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Father God, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you ahead of time for the service tonight. And Father, as we leave this place, we invite Jesus to go with us to the restaurant. We invite Jesus to go with us back at home. On Monday morning, we invite Jesus to go with us at work or school. Lord, we invite Jesus to be in every part of our lives. In his name we pray. And everybody that agreed said, Amen. God bless you. Six o'clock tonight service brother daniel preaching you don't want to miss it rangers missionettes start tonight did you go back roy and tell children's church